how to restore our voices are heard. This will give us some historical perspective of what has gone on in Minnesota in the past. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how this came to happen. Uh, Don Kilkinen of COAC um, called uh, Laura Radeke to see about setting something up in this area. And uh, Laura called me, and I'm always interested in especially things about getting people's voices and the uh, history of Minnesota. So I said I would be glad to uh, do some most of the basic organizing for it. And then we got a sponsor, major sponsor with, with the League of Women Voters. Uh, that was partially because my wife is the president of the League of Women Voters. <laughs> but it's, it's the kind of thing that the League uh, felt good about supporting. Um, the Lord led church, this church, uh, was glad to, uh, to make this site available to us, which was significant. And then uh, COAC was a kind of supporting sponsor. And I also want to mention <laughs> Steve Barrows, a uh, friend of mine, uh, who also did some hard work uh, getting the word out. Uh, and I want to mention him because he's now, today sometime, he had surgery on his knee. Not a knee replacement, but surgery. So he's not here tonight. Uh, but there were many other people who were a part of getting the word out, getting information out, and doing uh, a lot of the grunt work. And I want to thank all of them. And the result is we have a nice crowd tonight. Um, most of you have probably registered. If not, there will be some forms out there during the immigration. So we can let you know what other events uh, happen that you might be interested in. Um, there will be books for sale. This is the book. Uh, it's called Stand Up. Uh, after the after the event, and Rhoda will be glad to sign them. Right? right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to tell her she was going to do that and find out she really didn't want to. If you can imagine an author who going to sign the books. And uh, as always uh, with free events, there are still some expenses. And if anyone is so moved and they want to put a donation in the basket that's ordered by the coffee, they can do that. At any rate, <clears throat> um, I'm going to turn this over now to the president of the League of Women Voters, who will introduce Rhoda. This is my wife, Beth. Hi. <coughs> I had the pleasure of having dinner with Rhoda tonight. And, um, she got to our house about five, I think, and we had a delightful conversation. I learned a little bit more about her, but she's the author of several books on Minnesota history. Just this latest one is the one on the protest movement in Minnesota. She has a lot to say to us about what she's learned about watching Minnesotans <coughs> over the years, and um, I think you'll enjoy her presentation tonight. Um, will you join me in welcoming Rhoda Gilman? Representatives. 
Michelle Baca, and Keith Ellison. A lot of Minnesotans that I've talked to uh, seem to think that protest is a 21st century story, or at the very least, that it starts with the Farmer Labor Party and its rise to power in the 1930s. This may be because we've had no book that tells the whole story from the beginning, so I've tried to fill a gap uh, with this little easy to read outline. Uh, it's not that a lot of written stuff hasn't been written about Minnesota <coughs> history. It really has. Uh, Minnesota political history. Uh, but all of it is more or less in-depth studies of particular eras, movements, or people. Uh, a lot of those are listed in the reading list at the back of the book for those who want to go more deeply into any one particular story. Uh, but uh, there was still a need for something to bridge, uh, bridge the whole uh, period. Because the story starts all the way back with statehood. Uh, when we stop to think of it, uh, Minnesota spent most of its nine territorial years in the 1850s. And that was arguably the most polarized time in American history, just before the Civil War. By 1857, when they started to consider statehood, Minnesotans were so divided over the westward spread of slavery and the place of free black people in the future state that the territory's Democrats and Republicans couldn't meet together, even for the mundane job, and it was a rather mundane job, of drawing up a state constitution. Uh, so they were headed separately at opposite ends of what was then a rather small state capital. Uh, and in the end, they appointed a small committee to reconcile the differences. Uh, even that almost didn't happen. Uh, a Democrat got knocked on the head with a cane by a Republican who thought he had been insulted. Uh, fortunately for us, the Democrat had a hard head and the Republicans came, though. was that Minnesota squeaked into the Union just in time for the Civil War. And within another year, we had our own war with the Dakota Indians. Now, I haven't written a lot about that tragedy. I've written a lot, I should say, about that tragedy in the, my biography of Henry Sibley, which was published in 2004. And the small digest of Sibley's part in the Dakota War has just been published by the Historical Society as an e-book. Uh, there's a flyer about it out on the table there uh, and in the lobby, and uh, if anyone is interested, just help yourself to the flyer. We don't have, obviously, copies of e-books around, but uh, it can be ordered. One reason I didn't get into that very much in the present book is uh, that it went far beyond political protest, obviously. <coughs> then, and still today, many Dakota people would like to regard themselves as a separate sovereign nation, and not a part of the state's uh, political scene. That scene uh, had begun to take shape by 1870. Uh, after the Civil War ended, but even before the last gun had been laid down in the Indian Wars on the Western Plains. In the 30 years until the turn of the century, the Midwest, which was then known popularly as the Middle Border, uh, was swept by advancing and retreating waves of farm protests against the growing power of railroad and banking corporations and the two-party electoral system that supported them. And Minnesota led the way. Uh, some verses that were printed in a little Minnesota newspaper called the Anti-Monopolist said it all. All hail the national greenback cause. Let every free man break and cast away his party chains for his salvation's sake. In God we trust, our cause is just. And may our country be from interest, mortgage, bonds, and debts.
for whoever assumes that free. Uh, the first group of protests uh, rested with an organization called the Patrons of Husbandry, uh, better known as the Grange. Uh, and that was formed in 1868 by an Elk River farmer named Oliver H. Kelly. Uh, in the next two years, the Grange spread like wildfire across the country. Uh, but Kelly, although he claimed to be as full of public spirit as a dog is full of fleas, was neither actually a politician nor an orator. The recognized voice of the movement in Minnesota was Ignatius Donnelly, a radical young Republican congressman who was purged by his party in a bitter election in 1868 when it turned to conservatism after the Civil War. At the beginning of 1871, uh, Donnelly agreed to lectures for the Grange. Uh, it had 50 local chapters in the state, and by the end of the year, there were 300. I think uh, we should step back a moment and consider uh, some of the difficulties he faced. It wasn't just uh, Donnelly's skill as an orator or his charismatic personality, and he had both. Uh, that uh, produced that result. It was getting out there to all the small settlements across uh, western Minnesota, the prairies, and into some of the forest areas. Uh, remember that there was not a, a, even a railroad at that time. There were a few railroads in Minnesota, but nothing like uh, service to the old state. Travel uh, in that way today was by um, stagecoach or buggy or wagon, or if you were young and agile, by a baby by horseback. But um, it, was, it was a major feat of stamina, physical stamina, as well as uh, other organizational skill. But that growth, uh, that growth, and the waves of agrarian protests and third party populism that followed it are associated mainly with Donnelly. Today, he's almost forgotten. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. Uh, quite a few people have now. I've been talking of his name for a long time. Um, but uh, people around me was arguably, arguably the best known Minnesotan in the world at that time. People who had no idea where Minnesota even was had heard of him and had read his books. He wasn't just a politician, he was a, a skilled and popular writer. He wrote several books of pseudoscience, the best known even today, and it's still in print the last time I checked, uh, is Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, which really was the beginning of the uh, interest in the actual existence of a, an, a continent of Atlantis. And uh, another book that he uh, wrote at the time, uh, a couple of years later, was called Ragnarok, the Age of Fire and Gravel, in which he argued that the glacial till scattered across the, the uh, northern half, the, the polar uh, half of the world, and particularly the North American continent, was uh, what was left from uh, the Earth passing through the tail of a comet, or possibly being hit by uh, a comet or an extraterrestrial object. In those days, such a thing was inconceivable. Nobody ever, ever heard of it, and there's a lot of laughing at the book. Today, we might take it a little more seriously. We keep an eye out for those meteorites coming our way. <coughs> but anyway, uh, it dawned also fiction and his uh, all-time best-known and most-read book was a bestseller called Caesar's Call. It was a, a novel, I hesitate to call it a dime novel, it was a little above that class, but it was a, a cheap, popular novel, a uh, dystopian novel that predicted the uh, collapse of American society in 1988 as a result of a bloody conflict between the haves and the have-nots. 
Though it may have been, I, I always think it's rather a bit prophetic that uh, Don Way died on the first day of the 20th century. And in the next 50 years, the signs and songs of protest that had been carried by farmers largely uh, were picked up in Minnesota and elsewhere by industrial workers. For farmers, the population Populism of the 1890s uh, gave way to a couple decades of prosperity and reform, almost the progressive era. That's the era from which we get a parity crisis figure as, uh, for many years. Um, nationally, it's associated politically with Theodore Roosevelt, and Roosevelt was immensely popular in Minnesota. And uh, in Minnesota's sister state of Wisconsin, uh, the Progressive Era is, of course, associated with fighting Bob Lafollette and his outspoken suffragist wife, Belle Lafollette. Um, meanwhile, Minnesota was becoming an urban, industrial, as well as an agricultural state. Uh, great fortunes were being made from extractive industries like lumbering, mining, milling, uh, names like um, uh, Hill, Washburn, uh, Pillsbury, Weyerhaeuser were becoming household words. Uh, Minneapolis employers in the city of Minneapolis uh, built a wall against labor unions called the Citizens Alliance.